Good evening. My name is Mark Syme, the minister of the Northfield Church of Christ in Northfield, New Jersey. I would like to extend this opportunity to welcome you to our evening services for Sunday, October the 27th. As usual, we will sing several songs. Uh, we will observe the Lord's Supper, and I have a message that I hope will be beneficial to all of us. Here at Northfield, we sing from the songbook, Songs of Faith and Praise. If you don't have that book, uh, or you have another one, or you're quick on the Google, uh, you can look up the song and uh, hopefully sing along with us. I was really gratified as I looked over the uh, YouTube uh, uh, live streaming that we had 30 uh, views last week. So I'm just really pleased with that. And so this morning we will get begin with song number 202. 202. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. If the music sounds good uh, in this song, it is by Ludwig von Beethoven. I'm sure you've heard of him. <laughs> joyful, joyful, we adore thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like flowers before thee, opening to the sun above. Melt the sins of sin and sadness, drive the dark of doubt away. Giver of immortal gladness, fill us with the light of day. All thy works with joy surround the earth and reflect thy rays. Stars and angels sing around me, center of unbroken praise. Field and forest, vale and mountain, flowery meadows, flashing sea. Chanting bird and flowing fountain, call us to the rejoice in thee. Thou art giving and forgiving, ever blessing, ever blessed. Wellspring of the joy of living, ocean depth of happy rest. Thou our Father, Christ our Brother, all who live in love are Thine. Teach us how to love each other, lift us in Thy joy divine. Mortals join the mighty chorus, which the morning stars began. Father, love is reigning o'er us, brother, love binds man to man. Ever singing, march we onward, victory in the midst of strife. Joyful music leads us onward in the triumph of life. The next song will be 172. 172. I just came to praise the Lord. 172. I just came to praise the Lord. <coughs> <clears throat> I just came to praise the Lord. I just came to praise the Lord. I just came to praise His holy name. I just came to praise the Lord. I just came to thank the Lord. I just came to thank the Lord. I just came to praise His holy name. I just came to thank the Lord. I just came to praise the Lord. 
I just came to love the Lord my heart. I just came to praise His holy name. I just came to love the Lord. To prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper, let's sing number 335. 335 in memory of the Savior's love. <clears throat> in memory of the Savior's love. In memory of the Savior's love, we keep the sacred feast. Where every humble, contrite heart is made a welcome guest. By faith we take the bread of life with which our souls are fed. The cup in token of his blood that was for sinners shed. Beneath this banner thus we sing the wonders of his love. And here anticipate by faith the heavenly feast above. Every first day of the week we are commanded uh, to uh, partake of the Lord's Supper. Uh, in the 20th chapter of Acts, verse 7, while Paul was pe preaching at the town of Troas, and he preached to them, uh, actually he preached to them even till midnight that night, um, he gave us that famous instruction that we find that they gathered together on the first day of the week to break bread. Jesus established uh, what we come to know as communion of the Lord's Supper on the night in which he was betrayed. At when he explained that he was uh, uh, giving his body and his blood would be shed. Uh, the Apostle Paul in the 11th chapter of the book of 1 Corinthians, uh, almost word for word, explains that same um, memorial that we are to observe every first day of the week. And uh, as we uh, sang of the song, uh, it, it says, um, by faith we keep the bread of life. And we're going to partake of the bread in just a moment. The bread is a symbol of the body of Jesus. That is our bread of life. The body that Jesus gave up for each one of us, that we might be saved. And so as we gather about the table, let's think of Jesus's body as he made that one-time sacrifice for each of us. And uh, with that, uh, we have uh, God's grace poured over us because of the sacrifice that Jesus made. Let's pray for the bread. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that in your divine wisdom that at just the right time you sent Jesus to us that he left uh, being at your right hand, came down to earth in the form of a human being, that he preached and taught in a marvelous manner that none of us can even imagine, and that ultimately he died for the sins of the world, that he gave up his body for each of us. As we partake of the bread, let's help us remember that sacrifice and the suffering that he did on the cross. We pray this in his most holy name. Amen. I think again that the song that we just sang puts everything in perspective. It says, the cup in token of his blood that was for sinners shed. We have to always remember that 
Jesus shed his blood for the sinners of the world. And our, sinner, our sins can only be forgiven through the blood of Jesus Christ. And so as we memorialize his death uh, this morning by partaking the Lord's Supper, let's remember the precious blood that flew from it, that flowed from his head and his hands and his feet and his side. And uh, let's understand that that cup, uh, that blood uh, is uh, a token of his love. And that blood is what washes away our sins. Let's pray for the cup. Our Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that Jesus was willing to shed his innocent blood. We understand that blood is that life-giving substance within the body that uh, just uh, sends nutrients all through the body. And the, the blood of Jesus sends nutrients through us that we know that we can have our sins forgiven and that uh, Jesus and God remembers them no more. As we partake of this cup, let's remember the blood that was shed. We pray this in his most holy name. Amen. Having completed the Lord's Supper, we understand that on the first day of the week, we are also commanded to lay by in store, to give back to the Lord that which is his own. And so as we reflect upon that, uh, there is certainly a relationship between the Lord's Supper and giving back. Just the understanding that Jesus gave his life for us. And we are called upon to give of our uh, our monies so that the church can uh, do its purpose here on earth, that we can bring others to the Lord and that we can be of aid to those who are needy. And so as we think about giving back, help us to indeed, as the scriptures say, to give as we have prospered and to give in a cheerful manner. Let's pray for the contribution. Our Heavenly Father, we're grateful that uh, Jesus uh, came to earth. And with that, we understand that he came to earth uh, to save mankind. He put that in the hands of the church. Uh, and the church was built upon Jesus Christ. And we, as the called out, we as the church have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to go preach the word to all the world. And with that, you know, we come to understand in our society that it does take money to be able to do that. Uh, I just pray that we will give with an open heart, with an open mind. We'll give cheerfully as we have been told through the scriptures. We pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. The last song we will sing is number 763, O Master, Let Me Walk With Thee. Seven. 63, O oh, Master, let me walk with thee. <clears throat> oh, Master, let me walk with thee in lowly paths of perfect Tell me thy secret, help me bear the strain of toil, the fret of care. Help me the slow of heart to move by some clear wind. In word of love, teach me the way with thee to stay and guide them in the homeward way. 
In hope that sends a shining ray Far down the future's broadening way In peace that only Thou canst give with Thee, O Master, let me live. Um, I'm going to start a uh, Sunday evening series entitled The Closer Walk with God. And um, with that, I think that sometimes we need to reflect upon some of the events in our lives that we uh, look at as keystone events. Certainly our birth that we had nothing to do with. Um, graduation from a school, choice of an occupation, marriage if we choose to do that. And finally the ultimate, another thing that we don't have very much control over, and that is our death. I think these are the touchstones of what life is all about. Unfortunately, many Christians, I don't think appreciate that until late in life, but our service to God would be more productive and I believe infinitely more enjoyable if we began to grasp the true significance of being Christians and being children of God. And so this is the first in my lessons that I'm going to give on Sunday evenings over the next few weeks under the big heading of A Closer Walk with God. And this evening, I am going to talk about the blessings and the responsibilities of being a Christian. Um, first, in being a Christian, we come to understand that God is our Heavenly Father. Um, in the first... Uh, book of John, chapter 3 and verse 1. It talks about how great the love of the Father is. And the Father has bestowed this love upon us. And then it says, he looks upon us as his children. We're God's children. And he is our heavenly Father. And with that, there is so much that we get from having God as our Father. He is the source of every good gift. He is the source of every good gift because those good gifts are from above. He provides us with the comforts of life, as we are told in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. We know that uh, through his word, he chastises us when uh, we fall away when we don't do his good will. Hebrews chapter 12 verses 5 through 11 explains that. And with that, a couple of chapters later in Hebrews chapter 13 verses 5 to 6, uh, uh, the Hebrew writer says that he promises never to forsake us when we become his children. Isn't that an amazing thought? to rattle around in our head, that if if we are his children and we follow him as our father and we follow Jesus as our brother, that he will never forsake us. Yet, with that in mind, there are responsibilities for having God as our father. First, in James chapter 4, verse 7, it says we have to submit to our father. And part of that is submitting to him through the word of God, because the word of God is his Holy Spirit inspired words to us. And by submitting to his word, we submit to his providential workings in our life. If any of you have been reading any of my devotionals over the past week or so, uh, some of them uh, have uh revolved around um, our our job as Christians. And one of them is uh, 
to be the type of Christian that people would want to look up to, a role model, if I would have. And so with that in mind, understand that uh, there are certainly blessings of having God as our Father, and there are responsibilities. With that, we, not, we need to draw near to God, as James explains in the fourth chapter of his epistle, in verse 8. Yesterday, uh, our daughter uh, went to her brother's house and picked up our oldest grandchild, we have two of them, and brought uh, little Mark down with us for several hours. You don't know how good it felt when he walked in the house and I was downstairs sitting down and he came down and he climbed into my lap. It, it, it's just uh, an amazing feeling. It's an amazing feeling because, you know, my children are all grown up now. My oldest son is 50. My, all of my children are mid to upper 40s. I can't sit them in my lap anymore and, and love them the way I used to, even though I feel close to them and do. But having my grandson, you, you get that feeling of closeness that sometimes I think that we, we lose. And I think God delights in us wanting to be close to him as our father. And to draw near to God means that, that we need to meet his specifications. You remember being a child. You know, there were rules in your house growing up. You had to meet the specifications if you were going to function very well within uh, the, the family uh, because uh, it is set aside that way, that parents... Uh, take care of uh, their children, and the children are to grow uh, in such a way as the, the parents provide that good example for them. With that, we understand to draw near to God is a little different. To draw near to God, we need to purify our hearts. We need to cleanse ourselves and purify our hearts. That is by obtaining forgiveness. And then when we obtain forgiveness, I believe it strengthens our resolve to desire to serve him. For the Christian, this uh, involves some immutable things. It, it involves repentance. It involves confession of sins. And it involves prayer so that we can let our needs be known to God and that we can submit to him Requests that we have, not just for ourselves, but for others. And then there is the understanding that Jesus is our high priest. There was one high priest in the Old Testament. Now, there were many priests, but one was the high priest. On that special day in Judaism, it was only the high priest that could go into the inner sanctum of the temple in that place of the holy of holies. And before he did that, he had to cleanse himself. And so we understand that Jesus is our high priest. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14, it says, We have been given a great high priest, and he has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. And so, again, uh, we have to understand that uh, God is our father, and Jesus is indeed our brother. And so, when, you know, it's kind of interesting. We are at a time uh, in our country where we're voting for our new leaders. You know, uh, God in the Old Testament wanted to be the children of Israel's leader, yet they wanted a king. God would rather them than not had kings because he wanted to be their king. And we think about that and we, you know, we, if you've been watching TV, uh, we almost get disgusted with seeing the same messages over and over. Vote for me, vote for me, don't vote for him, don't vote for her, don't for, for, vote for them. We need to understand that our leader is God. 
that our leader is his son, Jesus Christ. We know this that because Jesus told us that in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, where he said, all authority has been given to me, both in heaven and on earth. And yet he calls us his brethren. With that, we are subject to God the Father. Again, just as parent uh, uh, children are subject to their parents. The high priest in the Old Testament interceded for the people. That's what Jesus does for us. When we pray to God, we always pray through Jesus Christ, knowing that Jesus will intercede with us to God. And I don't think the high priest of old knew what Jesus the high priest knew. Jesus understands all of our feelings. And part of that is because he was the son of God, but a big part of that is because he was the son of man. He came to earth and as a human, he felt the same thing that every other human felt. Yet with all that, Jesus was divine. He is a high priest who ever lives and makes intercession for us until we take our dying breath. When we pray to the Lord, we understand that through praying to God, Jesus intercedes with us to the Father. And so with that, what are our responsibilities of having Jesus as our high priest? Well, I think first, if he's truly our Lord, we need to do what he says. He said that succinctly in Luke chapter 6 and verse 46. We're told that we have to keep his commandments. John 15 verses 10 and verse 14. And, and you know what? It, you know, it's like having a car. We have a car for a purpose. We utilize the car. We have Jesus as our high priest. We need to use Jesus as our high priest because we know his role. It's only through Jesus, our high priest, that we can obtain mercy and we can find his grace in our time of need. And for this, uh, Christians have to pray constantly. Just as uh, it tells us in Second Thessalonians that we are to pray without ceasing. And then next on my list is understanding that in all of this and part of our responsibilities of being a Christian is understanding that Christ's spirit dwells in us. When we were baptized as the final act of salvation, Peter said, arise and be baptized. And remember the last part of it, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is that part that's in us that has to be the strong part because we've come to understand that the fleshly part of man is the weak part. The Spirit gives us strength to overcome uh, evil and to overcome fleshly deeds. It helps us in our weakness and then when we feel especially weak, that's the time that we need to pray. It's We need to understand that Jesus is our high priest, is our intercessor, and that God will answer our prayers. And what responsibilities do we have in that the Spirit dwells within us? Well, understand that we have been told that our body is the temple of God. Now, if you go back to old time uh, before Jesus, what was the temple? How did the people view the temple? That's where God lived. The temple where was where God is. We need to understand that God dwells within us. Our body is the temple of God. So how do you treat your temple? 
What do you do with your temple? We need to utilize our bodies to glorify God. And we need to walk in the Spirit and be led by the Spirit. And with that, if we go to Galatians chapter 5, we can produce the fruit of the Spirit. We can only provide the fruit of the Spirit if the Spirit dwells within us. If you read all of those fruits, and I call them fruits, but they are one fruit, how many of them do we engender? Is the Spirit working in us? Do we allow it to work in us powerfully enough that we can produce those fruits of the Spirit? How do we do that? Well, I would contend that we do that by setting our minds on the things of the Spirit and not on things of the earth. And last on my list when it comes to responsibilities of being a Christian, it is understanding that the church is our family. You know, Jesus talked about the church before there was a church. When Peter explained to him, when asked who he was, and when Peter gave that wonderful answer that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, he said, upon this confession, I will build my church. That's the kingdom of God that dwells on earth today. That's God's church. And as members, do you know what? We become fathers, we become mothers, we become sisters, and we become brothers. Women are supposed to help younger women. Older men are supposed to help, help uh, uh, younger men. And then we are to look at it as Christians that we're all brothers and sisters in the world. Um, it is so important to understand that our brothers and sisters in Christ are the ones that help us along our Christian walk. And so their responsibilities of having the church as our family. In Hebrews chapter 10, uh, verses 24 and 25, you know, we know 25 it tells about not forsaking the assembly, but verse 24 tells us to encourage one another toward love and good deeds. It's a responsibility of one Christian for another Christian. It requires doing our share. Uh, yesterday at our, and this may seem a little off track, we had a work day at church yesterday to clean up our building because our building is the place where we worship. We spent four or five hours. There were like 11 people that came and just helped. Why? Because they felt the responsibility. You know, it was announced we would have a work day and they utilized their abilities to help. It, they, they felt the need to do their share. And then there's something else. There's a spiritual aspect in that, in Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, we are told to bear one another's burdens. That is a physical and spiritual part. This is what the law of Christ is all about. You know, it requires as a church that we get to know each other as fellow Christians, that we come to know each other well, because this is our family. This is our church family. And this is the family that we need to provide support for and we look to for support. You know what? There are certainly many more blessings and responsibilities that we have as Christians. I think I've just scratched the surface this evening. I hope that the ones that I mentioned may suffice uh, in such a way that we will think about what our responsibilities and what our blessings are about being Christians. When we think of it, to me, bottom line is how blessed we are to be called children of God. And then how important it is for us to fulfill our responsibilities as Christians. Because as we fill our responsibility as Christians to others, we fulfill our responsibility to Christians as God.
as, as, uh, to God as we are supposed to do. And so with that, as we, we think about that, as we started the lesson, we, we noted in John chapter three, verse one, that John talked to us as children of God. And so this evening, I will offer the invitation to you to become a child of God. It's set forth in the scripture that we need to hear and believe his word, accept it. We need to repent of our former lives. We need to confess Jesus as the son of God. With that, we'll soon come the understanding that Jesus will be our intercessor and high priest and be baptized for the remission of our sins. If that's your need this evening, uh, you can contact one of us or see us on the Lord's Day, and we will help you in any way to make your way to being a Christian. Let's all pray as we finish our lesson this evening. Our Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for the opportunity that we had this evening to think just a little bit about our responsibilities of being a Christian and the blessings that we derive from doing so. Continue to bless us as your children. Help us to indeed think of, of what a wonderful blessing it is to be called a child of God. And with that, fulfill the responsibilities that we have as Christians to both do your will and help others who are on that same walk. Continue to be with us. We know that you are the God of comfort. Help us to, as we receive your comfort, to desire to comfort others. Help us in any way possible to do your will uh, that we might be the type of Christians that you would be proud of, that we would walk the walk and not just talk the talk because you are our father and Jesus is our brother. Continue to be with us this evening. I pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Please be safe and may God bless you all.